it's helpful to rephrase a bunch of the results we've developed for congruence modulo n uh, in terms of an algebraic structure called the ring Zn. The basic idea is that in remainder arithmetic, every time you get a number that overflows the remainder interval, you, if you want to, you can bang it and put it back in the remainder interval by dividing by the modulus and taking the remainder. But in the meantime, it regularly the case that the numbers are overflowing and you're dealing with all the integers, but you're working with them modulo n. It's uh, it turns out to be slick if we just force ourselves to only work with the numbers in the remainder in the remainder interval. So that's the idea behind the ring z sub n. It, we're only working with numbers in the remainder interval, and so what happens is we're going to define this thing called addition in z n. i and j are going to be numbers in the remainder interval, and when we add them, we're going to immediately go to the remainder of i plus j modulo n, and i times j likewise is going to be defined to be equal to remainder of i times jn. So that means that automatically when in zn you multiply i times j, it's another element that's in zn. When you add i and j in zn, it's an element in zn. And this structure consisting of those intervals, the integers in that remainder interval, the integers from 0 to n, includes, including 0, not including n, uh, under the two operations of plus and times in Zn is called Zn. <laughs> I guess we guess we could have guessed that. It's also known as the ring of integers modulo n. Well, let's just take a quick look at some practice. Um, 3 plus 6 in Z7 now is equal to 7. It's not congruent to 7. It's literally equal to 7 by the definition of this plus, which says create 9 and then take the remainder of 9 divided by 7. Likewise, 9 times 8 is equal to 6 in Z11 because by definition of this operation times in Z11, it's 9 times 8 is 72, and then immediately take the remainder on division by 11, which is 6. Uh, and so in short, all we're doing is replacing congruence modulo n with equality in this algebraic structure Zn. And, but it's going to see in, in, in the video after this one that working with equality makes some arguments just a little bit simpler to state and formulate. What's the connection between uh, equivalence mod n versus working in Zn? Well, it's really the same as the connection that we already had between equivalence mod n and remainders. Namely, we know that i is congruent to j mod n if and only if r of i is equal to r of j over actual numbers, but of course r of i is equal to r of j since r of i and r of j are already remainders in the right remainder interval. They're equal if and only if they're equal in Zn. So uh, this is the connection that summarizes the, uh, the relations of numbers modulo n to relation to numbers in Zn. It's trivial. We're just changing congruences into equalities. Now, Zn satisfies a bunch of algebraic rules, and that's this abstract idea of a ring that's worth knowing about. We're not going to go into ring theory, but uh, it's, uh, it's such a basic concept mathematically that it's worth being aware of. Zn is kind of the simplest example of a ring. Um, so a ring is an algebraic structure that's got two operations, plus and times, that you can apply to the elements in this ring. And plus and times satisfy a bunch of properties. And they're very familiar properties that we well know from the integers. And you can verify that they also work for Zn. One of them is that you can parenthesize a sum any way you want. Uh, and that's called associativity. Another is that there's an, uh, an element called 0 that if you add it to something, you get the same thing. Adding by 0 doesn't change anything. That is called the identity axiom. It says that 0 is an identity. Identities are the, are the things that leave other stuff alone. It keeps them identical. Um, then in Zn, um, the general rule for, uh, for uh, rings is that for any element i, there is another element called minus i which is equal to 0. i plus minus i is 0. Now in Zn, uh, uh, we're not going to go, we haven't defined the operation minus, and we're not going to go negative by saying, what's the inverse of 2 mod 7? Um, uh, well, it's not going to be minus 2, because minus 2 is not a number in Z7. But of course, there's easy to find one that acts like this. So every element i has an inverse 
um, which we'll call minus i in Zn, which is equal to zero, the identity. And of course, this one, the last one is very familiar, that, um, that it doesn't matter the order in which you add things. That operation is called commutativity of addition. Well, multiplication sounds a bunch of, uh, like a bunch of uh, similar properties. Um, so the general rules for rings, rings satisfy the structures with plus and times is that in addition to those plus axioms, the time axiom, times axioms are very similar. You can parenthesize a product any way you want. That's associativity of multiplication. There's an identity for multiplication. It's called one. one multiplying by one doesn't change anything. It leaves things identically alone. And finally, i times j is equal to j times i. Uh, we get a commutativity of multiplication. Now notice that we didn't have cancellation. Uh, and I'll say more about that in a minute. That was the one axiom that appeared for plus that did not appear for times. Uh, the key final axiom of the eight that characterize rings is the one that connects times and plus called distributivity, name, which again, a very familiar fact from, from integers and polynomials and other rings that you're used to working with without knowing that they were rings is i times j plus k is equal to ij plus ik. And it's easy enough to check from the definitions that every one of these ring axioms is satisfied by Zn. But as I said, there's no cancellation rule. And this is to be expected because there's no cancellation in mod n, and we could anticipate that it's going to carry over to Zn. Um, so let's look at an example. <clears throat> in Z10, 3 times 2 is 6, and 8 times 2 is 6. So these two things are equal. But of course, you can't cancel the twos because if you tried to, you would discover, you'd think that three was equal to eight, but it's not. So you can't cancel two in Z10. Uh, well, when can you cancel it? It's the same answer that we had for modular arithmetic. Um, it's when uh, the number is relatively prime to n, then you can cancel it in Zn. So let's let Zn star be all of those elements that are relatively prime to n. and the same theorem that we had for congruence can be translated over into a statement about Zn. An element i is in Zn star if and only if the GCD of i and n is 1. That's by definition. If and only if i is cancelable in Zn, if and only if i has an inverse in Zn. And the proofs are the same as the proofs that we had for modular arithmetic, just free rephrased in terms of the ring um, Zn. Finally, um, the phi of n, which we saw previously uh, in a previous lesson, was the, num was the number of numbers that were relatively prime to n. Um, the number uh, in the interval from 0 to n inclusive exclusive. And that's nothing but the size of Zn star. So we could have defined phi of n as equal to the size of Zn star. We sort of did. Um, and finally, we come to the, uh, the main result that we're aiming for, which is the, the technical result that is underlies RSA encryption and also enables you to do lots of calculations of with high powers modulo n or in Zn. Namely, that if you take a number and raise it to the phi of nth power, it equals 1, at least if the number is itself cancelable and has an inverse. That is, it's in Zn star. And that's what we're going to work on proving in the next video segment.